Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 223. Slow down. Slow down. One word or two. This vlog takes us out of the comma series and thank you so much for the unbelievable feedback we've had from friends all around the world. It's been amazing. And we have a whole series of requests in front of us now, mainly involving writing. There's a cluster around writing and different ways of writing. And we also have a cluster of requests around teaching and teaching imperatives. And that's great. But I did want to pause for a moment and offer this singular vlog that comes via request from Adrian. Hi Adrian. And also a rather majestic group of students we have at Flinders University that we nickname the Completers. Let me explain. Twice a year, every six months, we run what's called a completion intensive. That is for the students who are finishing their PhD in the next six months or so. And as you can imagine, that group is stressed very intense, very focused, incredibly inspirational. But the intensive gives those students the space to ask the difficult questions, explain the examination process to them all, and really orient themselves in this final, often pretty complicated phase of a PhD. But this group, when they were asking very difficult questions of their dean, left me with a really interesting question that I was always going to address for them. And they asked me, the whole group, you know, okay, so we finished this thing. We finished the PhD, we finished the Masters, but what is the world going to look like on the other side of this? Now, Adrian wanted me to talk about the future and futurists and future planning and really answer the societal question that's dominating morning television at the moment. When will we return to normal? And of course the more subtle questions, what actually is normal and why would we want to return to it? So I'm really quite struck by that question and I wanted to introduce a book to you that will provide a guide for us through that really provocative question for you, for me, for us, for the planet. And I've been reading a series of monographs and articles published in 2020, a lot of them the last little bit, and you know, written you know, just before or during the COVID crisis and the publishing cycles have been very, very interesting to watch. And there's no doubt that sort of futurists are a bit of a problem. Futurists have always frightened me. Marionetti and his ilk show really one of the tragic consequences of an arcs of futurism. But also so much of futurism can just be really bad research. You know, it can be teleological, picking and mixing evidence to try and create an interpretation. And for me, the issues of relevance, representativeness, and generalizability are always troubling. But it is such an interesting question to consider, isn't it? Will we return to normal? When will we return to normal? But what is normal and do we want to go there? All of that is fascinating and I really want to think about what we've all learnt in the last six months and what we've shared. And I think what we've seen evidentially is that the nations that have done better in terms of health, in terms of survival, in terms of economic management and the capacity to understand this new reality and try and make the best of it, they're the nations that had some sort of commitment to public good. So they're the nations that have a functional public health system and of course public health policies and the countries that did okay still have a commitment to experts and expertise so a recognition that there are people in our culture who are very bright and who know something that is of value of more value than what some random on twitter has to say 
you know, those people that know stuff, you know, read, <laughs> research, have conducted research and they're sharing their expertise. And that's great because if we listen to them, we'll learn something. So the nations that are hyper-individualistic and have problematic public health systems, and I'm thinking particularly about the United States and Brazil, but there are others, they're the ones that had problems. The nations that have a very strong ideology about individual choice and individual freedoms. Now, ironically, that commitment to individual freedom made people sick and increase the spread of COVID because there was no commitment to the public good, a recognition that if we socially distanced, I'll use that weird phrase, and we made personal sacrifices for the members of our community who may be vulnerable in some way, then our individual choices can be of help, can be of service to others. So instead, in some nations, it all got a bit confused between personal freedom and individual choices and the public good. Right, so similarly, nations that critiqued experts or expertise for, the, for much of the decade didn't do too well. And I'm thinking very strongly here of the United Kingdom, my second home. I, I lived there for a decade, love it. Uh, and I'm thinking particularly the expertise problem in the United Kingdom is not going away. Of course, as we all know, it had consequences for the Brexit issue and revealed profound problems there. And some of you may remember Michael Gove, still uh, a member of the British Parliament. Michael Gove made a statement on Sky News, the British Sky News, that really became the catch cry of the Brexit referendum. And that was, quote, people in this country have had enough of experts, end of quote. So while such an ideology may have delivered a, a Brexit result to the government of the day, it also crushed that faith in experts and expertise. So people who have dedicated their life, like many of you, to knowledge, to research. And that's had profound, wow, consequences because expertise is not a tap that you can turn off and on. Public good is not a tap that you can turn off and on. So when it came to respecting experts in public health in the COVID crisis, the United Kingdom faced a really rocky road. And the result was that the United Kingdom had more deaths, more cases of COVID-19 than the combined total of all other European Union members. And there's something troubling, disturbing, but also should fill us all with a fair amount of despair. And as you can see, the university matters in this time. Research matters in this time. And I recommend to you a wonderful book, again, one of these books that I've been reading, published in 2020, called The Fully Functioning University. Great book by Tom Berner et al. The Fully Functioning University. Great book, published 2020 by Emerald. And these scholars confirmed that less than 100 years ago, global life expectancy was under 34 years of age. 34 years of age, a century ago. It's now over 70, as confirmed by the World Bank in 2019. So why do universities matter in the history of humans, let alone the history of humanity? And they are different. Well, in the last century, the university has been the primary source of research the primary source of progress and the font for the advancement of knowledge. The university is also integral to how knowledge is accumulated, disseminated and applied. So almost all of the knowledge that has been generated in the last century came from a university. 
or indeed from researchers who were, you've guessed it, trained at a university. So the university has three functions, research, teaching and service, and they can get a bit contradictory and messed up at times. And the tension between those three jobs, roles, functions, the tension is probably worsening. But one of the causes of that tension is the expansion of universities in the last 50 years in particular. The number of universities has expanded and of course the number of students, wow, has risen exponentially. So let's think about those changes in universities in the last 50 years. We've got an increased number of universities, the widening participation, the massification of higher education through the student body, an increased diversity of students, increased fees for tuition. We've got quantitative assessment of quality of teaching. Quantitative. So what is quality teaching? And we now supposedly can study that quantitatively. Rock and roll. And of course, funding is tied to those targets that are studied quantitatively. Oh, we're winning here. Uh, the development, the dominance of league tables, the rise of performance indicators, research measurement, RAE, REF, ERA, and now teaching measurement, the TEF. Attention to graduate employability and creating those workplace ready graduates. Development of new awards, new qualifications. The professional doctorate is the great example of that. So in the United Kingdom, the prof dog wasn't really heard of before the early 1990s. In Australia, we had a little bit more movement at the end of the 1980s. So we have a slightly longer history of the prof dog. But also increased governmental involvement in higher education policies and practices. And the development of, of course, online learning which has all sorts of problems, but also has profound strengths because learning and teaching can suddenly move in really interesting, provocative and very diverse ways. So as you can see, with all those changes, the university sector was volatile before COVID. <laughs> and universities were monitored, they were watched, they were twisted, they were underfunded, they were devolved of functions. And the undermining of the expertise, the expert, the undermining of knowledge has been part of politics for at least 20 years. Okay, so this is part of what Jean Baudrillard referred to as the double refusal. For me, this is really the concept of the last five years. To understand what's gone wrong on the planet, really, Baudrillard's double refusal explains it. And the refusal is, the double refusal is the refusal to lead and the refusal to be led. Let me explain what that means. So this means we have a group of citizens that do not want to be led. They have no faith in their leaders. They're just not interested in leadership, right? They're just doing their own thing. And similarly, for some reason, we've got this group of leaders that are not terribly interested in sort of leading. They sort of like the title and the vibe and stuff, but actually when it comes to, to leadership and leading, they can't really do it. That's the double refusal. Therefore, noting these changes in both the university and the society that we're meant to serve, I wanted to talk about Danny Dawling's new book. Danny Dawling's new book, Slow Down. One word, slow down. And what we learn about our normality and how returning to this normality may not actually be possible or indeed desirable. So Danny Dawling is the Halford Mackinder Professor of Geography at the University of Oxford. But he's attended and worked in an array of universities, including the legendary University of Newcastle. Hi to all my friends at the University of Newcastle. And worked through not only Newcastle, but Bristol, Leeds, Sheffield, did a good northern tour of universities, but also worked for a time in Aotearoa, New Zealand. In collaboration with scholars around the world, he created World Mapper, one word, www.worldmapper.org. It's a map of who has the most and the least in the world. Powerful project. And he has committed to open access publishing, as we all should do. Uh, and we see all his open access free materials available from www.dannydawling.org. So he's interested in education, poverty, health, 
housing, employment, basically the perfect scholar for this time. Therefore, his research has really helped me solidify some of the reflections we need for this time. And he's also a great model for us, I think. He is an international scholar. He publishes books. He has a commitment to dissemination of knowledge through an array of open access platforms. This is good. So the full title of the book that we're using today is Slow Down, one word, but the subtitle is important. The End of the Great Acceleration and Why It's Good for the Planet, the Economy, Our Lives. So the word slow down, and I love this stuff, you know, the word slow down, one word, has a very unique etymology. It was first used in the 1890s, important period for the world really, the 1890s. And it was used to describe the desire to go forward more slowly. Go forward more slowly. And there's a real reason why that imperative emerged at that time. The first industrial revolution had happened, the second industrial revolution had emerged. It's also stabilised, but of course the industrial revolutions had huge consequences for human lives, health, sickness, quality of life. To get that economic progress, there was a human cost. And at this point, with those two industrial revolutions exhausted, there was a desire to go forward, you've guessed it, more slowly to consolidate economic and social relationships and think about progress, think about development in different ways. And there were all sorts of movements and countervailing forces through the 20th century that continued this movement. We're thinking John Maynard Keynes is the obvious example, but you know, groups like the Bloomsbury Group, right? Or an array of leisure or health or well-being movements. Yoga is just one example. But mostly the 20th century saw the preponderance of the exploitation of resources for maximum profit. So we sit here today with the triple threat of COVID, economic recession, social unrest. And this is clearly another moment to think about a slowdown. To enact this project therefore requires that we all think about the concepts that have undergirded our lives, progress, innovation, development. So much of our society, so much of our culture has been based on growth. Growth. We don't really even think about what growth is, but growth is good. The notion, not greed is good, growth is good, interesting. The notion that a future population will be larger than the present population, and that that increasingly large population will continue to buy and consume goods at a higher and higher rate. So this means that any present inadequacies can be managed because of course the future populations, which will be bigger, the future populations will pay for it via increasing consumption and increasing their production. Okay, right. You can see the problem that has suddenly emerged here. The global population right now <laughs> is shrinking and aging. And COVID has created this reflexive space, accidentally, this reflexi reflexive space for millions of people to ask really complicated questions. Do we need such a large number of people producing goods that have very little value for consumers? Do we need to start thinking about people as citizens rather than as consumers? Do we need all this stuff that contributes so very little to our lives, except really accumulating debt? <laughs> then there is the matter of sustainability. Through most of our lives, all of our lives, we've been used to industries that make profit by digging stuff out of the ground. And by other industries that make profit, by taking that stuff that's been dug out of the ground and making it into something to sell. Now, Tanya Steele, the chief executive of the World Wildlife Fund, offered a pretty powerful and potent view of this model of production and consumption. She stated, quote, we are the first generation that knows we are destroying the planet 
and we are the last generation that can do anything about it. Now I sat with that sentence for quite some time. It is what Paul Virilio used to describe as a thought bomb. Poof. Because it shatters our socialisation and it demands that we think differently. So we've become used to change. In fact, we've become used to accelerated change and we've normalised it. But the challenge is, as the world has continued to become richer, and there's no doubt that's occurred, each change has provided a smaller dividend. How hard do we have to work? How many hours do we have to work each day to buy stuff that we don't need? Or conversely, how many people need to be unemployed, underemployed, locked in casualised work so that they can't gain food security, they can't gain housing security? How many people have to go through that before we realise that's not just an individual problem? Sort of summoning a sad and sick and modern version of Gareth Steadman Jones, the deserving and the undeserving poor. Are we back there? Wow. So COVID has meant that many nations are pretty well showing now uh, an unemployment rate of about 10%. Right, that's a formal unemployment rate of about 10%. 10% is sort of the magic figure, and that's often described as structural unemployment. And that is labour surplus levels that reduce wages. So when you get to 10%, 10% of the population is unemployed, that's a labour surplus, and that's reached a figure where that labour surplus impacts on wages. Right. It also, however, reduces the tax base that has a consequences on the funding of health and the funding of education and the population gets sicker. You see what happens. And of course, it markedly increases the proportion of the population living in poverty. And particularly what we start to see because of the feminization of poverty is we start to see more and more children living in poverty. Right. So what does this time mean? How is it changing who you are? And how is it changing what you find meaningful? Now, you may disagree with Dawling. You may disagree with me. And that's brilliant. That's what these vlogs are about. They're about opening up the complicated and difficult conversations, presenting some evidence, and you disagreeing with me. That's what it's about. But there's no doubt that the slow down, the slow down, is a time of reflection. And to use dissonance, use disagreement. That's important. So we can work out what is of value. What is clear though is that the age of expansion is over. The rapid technological change gig, that's over. The major movement of people around the world is over. What Dawling predicts is startling and I think it is worth our consideration. Quote, Sometime in the 2020s, confidence in the market begins to fall. Not short-term confidence, but long-term confidence. Something fundamentally different is happening. Something that you cannot recognise the size or the shape of. You have not seen this before. This time really is different. Clients are increasingly demanding more and wanting to risk less. You begin to realise just how much of what you've always believed to be right was so very wrong. End of quote. Wow. Okay, well, this is the slow down moment. Put another way, this time asks of us, how are we going to live with the repercussions of our actions. How are we going to live with the actions of others? Now, many of us, quite right, they might just go, whoa, this, this, no, nah, this is just too much. This moment of reflection is just simply too much and retract back to normality, to shopping, to working in relatively meaningless jobs and pretending that the colour of nail polish and the type of car that you drive is actually important. <laughs> 
This is called agnosia, by the way. This is a thing. Agnosia. What a great word. The inability to recognize something, even though there's no sensory or memory impairment. Okay, so this is the slowdown where we stop trying to work faster and faster and faster and faster and we stop trying to get an identity from what we buy and start to think about meaning and start to think about purpose. Now Danny Dawling argues that we are entering a time where consumption will decline. Provocative conversations are going to emerge about the relationship between wealth and happiness. There will be an emphasis on cooperation rather than competition and will understand the value of the free. The walk in the sunrise, watching the sunset. And the incredible opportunity that the online environment does provide for us. We can today go onto YouTube and see the best scholars in the world share their expertise. We can read for free high quality open access materials. What a gift. What a gift. This is going to have an incredible impact on our institutions. So government, families, healthcare facilities, schools and of course our universities. Dawling argues that the slowdown will reveal a lag in our universities. That is, the institutions will not change very quickly, but the attitudes of the people within them will change and quickly. This means, therefore, if that's right, and what a provocative thought bomb that is, if that is right, then the rest, the, we're going to spend the rest of our professional academic careers working in institutions that no longer fit with what we believe in, right? So the slowdown through COVID has revealed the lies, the masks, the veils, the shadows, the images. Because we have been, through this time, released from agnosia. But the imperative of the governments around the world is get back to normal, get back to normal, get back to normal as soon as possible. So the institutions may return to normal. The people within them won't. So how will we, as students, as researchers, as citizens, manage this gulf? It is a time to remember what the slowdown, what the shutdown taught us. And I think what it taught us was the knife of a really powerful question. What matters to you? What matters in your life? We've learnt that fairness is not determined by those in power. Fairness is determined by those not in power. We've learnt that the public good is more than individual choice. And if we minimise the public good, people will die. We've learned that if happiness exists, it emerges through the relationship with other people, not our relationship with things. And I think we've learned that education and expertise matters quite a bit. And I think we've also realised that the pay that someone receives <laughs> has little to do with the capacity of that person to do public good. There's no relationship between pay and the capacity of that person to do good in the culture. And my respects to all the nurses out there and the allied health professionals. Doreen Massey, the legend, once said, quote, to make a real difference, we need to shift common sense, change the terms of debate and shape a new political terrain. End of quote. So I wanted to finish with one exercise for us all to do, to remember this shutdown, to remember this slowdown, to think about what we've learned, how we may have changed, even as our institutions are returning to normal. So here's your question. You ready? Here's your question. What has happened to you 
in the last year that was important. List five things in the last year that happened to you, happened to you, that were important. List them. Now pause the video at this point if it helps. So five things. Last year, five things happened to you. Cool. Important. Let me tell you my five. And my five came really quickly. One, standing on the edge of the ocean <laughs> at Willoughby Lighthouse on Kangaroo Island with a breeze so strong it was cleaning out my small intestines. Amazing. Wow. Lighthouse. Wow. Ocean. Wow. Big. Two, playing Scrabble with Jamie during the shutdown. Brilliant. Three, we had a beautiful, calm, relaxed, gorgeous Christmas Eve. I'll remember it forever. Four, finishing the final draft of the Creative PhD, our new book that's just come out. But it was that finishing it on the screen, so I just finished the final draft. And that was great. Finishing a book is always that sort of moment. But it meant so much more because I shared it with Natalie Hills and Tiffany Lindell Knight, my two co-authors, knowing it was their first book and that we did it together during tough times. So that gave me, what a moment that was, incredible satisfaction. I had a bit of a cry. I always have a bit of a cry. And five, being able somehow to rec write, record and edit my audiobook, Memories of the Future. The audiobook audio recording it, I was able to learn new skills and that was great, but also forcing myself to try and get the words out. That helped me sort of recontextualise and work through some of the pain, some of the tragedies. So a powerful moment. There's five. That's the last year. Now that list came to me very quickly. There was just no doubt. There were the five things. That was it. And as you can see, almost all of that list involves sharing experiences <laughs> with other people experiencing nature, gaining satisfaction through writing. None of these important moments <laughs> involved paid work. None of those important moments involved stuff that I bought or what other people think of me. None of those moments involved political leaders, what some random guy said on Twitter, or the colour of my nail polish, which yes, I know. Is tremendous. So through this exercise, agnosia lifts and we see our doctorate, we see our lives with the veils suddenly dropped away. And that's the gift of the slowdown. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.